What phobias do you have? Do you know what the meaning of phobia is? Phobia means that you have a fear of something. With some people, it's government phobia. Some people, it's wife phobia or husband phobia or teenage phobia. That one's worthy of consideration. Adolescence phobia. Paul had a phobia of certain brethren. He even made the comment in Galatians, I am afraid of you. Yet I know he didn't feel that way about every single solitary Christian because he has too much to say in too many letters about how much, uh, such, such as the Philippian letter, how much they meant to him, how much they'd helped him. But sometimes we might do well to ask, just what makes me afraid? Do I have a hang-up on it or something like that? Well, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit today about problems with being on the safe side. Well, how do those two fit together? Problems of being on the safe side. We'll look at one in particular. There's probably others. In fact, I'm sure there are as far as any problems that arise within us for being on the safe side side. You might ask the question, what do you mean by the safe side? Well, this is a spiritual message, so it must have something to do with serving God. According to the dictionaries, being on the safe side means avoiding danger with a margin of error. I like sometimes the way dictionaries define terms. Avoiding danger with a margin for error. So something being on the safe side, we can conclude from that, whatever it is, being on the safe side can be proper and even wise. However, there can be a difference in what is wise and what is safe. Sometimes what is safe, according to the given Circumstances, situation, what's being talked about is unwise. Those who save their lives will lose them. Didn't Jesus say something about that? Sometimes what is safe is unwise and then the other way around. It can be dangerous or even sinful if one elects to always, under any and all circumstances, always be on the safe side or the side that is safe. <coughs> Erring on the side of caution can lead to fear of the wrong kind. Why it can even lead to hypocrisy, pretending to be something you know you're not. And it can lead to compromising the truth in what you teach and in your conduct. This is nothing more or less than lack of faith, as it's taught in the Bible, on these people's part. Faithfulness, as described in both the Old and New Testaments, faithfulness of those that serve God, often demands that Christians leave their safe rooms. That they leave their safe spaces, their comfortable areas. Do you have comfortable areas? Do you like to be disrupted and moved out of them? Well, I know for a fact, the older you get, the more you like to be left alone <laughs> and not bothered. One of the wonders of young couples having babies is that they're not going to be left alone and they're going to be bothered greatly for quite a while on down the road. And maybe someday we'll hear something said like they're back and they brought somebody with them. So there's all sorts of things that can get us out in different areas of life, our safe space. And considering becoming a Christian and all that the New Testament defines Christian to be and how it's used, is one of those things that will get you out of your safe space, turn your whole life upside down from the perspective of the world 
but right side up as you follow the truth that God's put into this world to get you to heaven. Now in this sermon we're addressing the fear, the phobia that some on the safe side have in one particular area. Very important area when it comes to the church being all God said the church ought to be. Spreading the truth and defending, and that is controversy. I knew a man, I don't know if he's alive now or not, but his view of any controversy is that it was just over particular likes and dislikes. Well, I grant you, there's certainly a lot of that around. <laughs> that people just uh, cause all sorts of problems over their peculiar desires and getting their own way or whatever. But I don't know how anybody can believe this is the Word of God to read about the life of Christ who was tempted in all points kind of like as we are yet without sin and see Him, and we had a lectureship on this a few years ago, Christ the controversialist, and see Him in all manner of controversy and say, well, He just liked to do that. He just enjoyed a rip it and a fuss. As I say, there are people no doubt like that. But our Lord caused more trouble and was involved in more controversy than I think about anybody ever could be. And he did it all because he loved God. He had the proper perspective of life in the flesh. He knew what he came to do. And he knew what he had to do. And he knew he couldn't let anybody stop him. In order to save each one of us and give man the opportunity to be saved from their sins. And make the way by being faithful in the church to eternal life. You'll remember that Paul spoke of the time in Galatians 2 when he needed to confront a fellow apostle, Cephas, Peter, Galatians 2, 11 through 14. The scripture reads, and I think about this, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, for he was to be blamed. The Greek, uh, withstood to the face, means literally mouth to mouth. And I've often called this mouth to mouth resuscitation for Peter. He says, he gives us the reason that had to take place. He said, before that certain came from James, he did eat with Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them. Mark that down. He's got a phobia. Fearing them which were of the circumcision. Now, if you know the law of Moses, you know the Jews faithful to it while it was in effect could not have the same association and fellowship with non-Jews or Gentiles, as they did with one another. And if you want to read of the conversion of the first uncircumcised Gentile convert, read Acts at 10, and then read also Acts 11, where Peter, by, recorded by Luke, gives you an account of exactly how it happened as to Cornelius' his household's conversion. And you'll see that it took a special miracle from heaven given to Peter in a vision three times to cause him to begin to understand that he should not call things common that God had cleansed. And that specifically was pointing at the Gentiles, the uncircumcised Gentiles. Because remember, the Jews made a difference in a proselyte and an uncircumcised Gentile. That's what we don't want to miss when we look at the conversion in Acts 10 of Cornelius. Proselytes were there on the day of Pentecost when the church started. But uncircumcised Gentiles were. Because the Jews treated them completely different. It had nothing to do with them. And Peter tells those that have come from Cornelius, you know that's an unlawful thing for us Jews to have anything to do with you. He was honest. He told him. And he even argued with the Lord. When according to the law, the Lord in that sheet lets down all these creatures and tells Peter to rise and kill and eat. All these creatures are not authorized by the law of Moses for you to eat. Peter actually says to the Lord, not so, Lord, for nothing is entered my mouth that's called common or unclean. Three times that happened, and Peter was still sitting on the rooftop trying to figure out what does this mean? There's a message from God on this when those folks sent from Cornelius were out the gate. And he learned. And it came real clear to him when he got to the household of Cornelius. Cornelius related what happened, how it happened. Peter put two and two together. It didn't take very long. And declared of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But what does it say right here in verse 12? 
He withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were the circumcision. That's Jews. When they came to Antioch. The Gentile church, they came to Antioch. Peter's going right along. Eating with the Gentile brethren. But these Jews came and he withdrew. As well as others he caused to withdraw from them. Verse 13, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. Insomuch that Barnabas, he's the one called the son of consolation. So active in the church. Also was carried away with their dissimulation. You see, here's fear in a bad way. And we're taught, fear God and keep his commandments. That's a proper respect to all of God. So much so it leads us to render obedience to him. Well, this fear right here is a fear of people. Fear of losing your association with them. Them thinking highly of you if you do a certain thing. But Paul had the right attitude about it. And it's the one we must have on all things pertaining to what God's authorized us to do and the obligations we're to discharge and being faithful to Him. Verse 14, Paul wrote, When I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do Jews? We who are Jews by nature, and that tells us why the Jews continued many times to do a lot of things of the law. You see, it wasn't just like a religious organization as we look around us today. The Jews were an actual people among all other people, a civil nation. And they had a right to do those things just like we celebrate the 4th of July. And they could continue to do it in this time period as long as they didn't do it in order to be saved by Christ. As long as they didn't do it in order to go to heaven. So they could continue to be circumcised. That was all right. But you'll never find anywhere, not one single solitary word in the New Testament where they could teach Gentiles. That's what they ought to do. Up comes the Judaizing teacher who says, yes, the Gentiles can be saved by Christ, but they must be circumcised and keep the law. And that's what's happening right here. And Acts 15 gives the historic account of what it happened. So he goes ahead and develops that particular matter there because the Galatian churches were disturbed by this false doctrine and it took this letter from Paul as he dealt with them, exposing them for what they were. They were making a law God never made and they were binding it as if it was God's will. And by the way, it's interesting to know that the first big trouble in the church was not over liberalism. It was over antiism. Binding where God has not in His authoritative word bound. You Gentiles can be saved by Christ. But after you believed in Him, repented of your sins, confessed your faith in Him, and been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, that's not the end of it. You must be circumcised to keep the law. And that's when Paul, when he heard that, said we didn't give space to them at all. I guess we'd say he jumped right in the middle of them. Controversy. Controversy. Some people have a phobia when it comes to that. And you can see what happens to a man as great as Peter, even a man who God revealed. I'm not to call a Gentile a second-class somebody. He approaches God under the gospel system just like all of us do. Yet here he is down here at Gentile church. And because of certain people, he fears them. And he backs off and doesn't engage in scriptural fellowship. Now, why is that in your Bible? You read it. What do you get out of it? I don't know that we have any problems with Jewish brethren. And since I think I'll save maybe one who may be a Samaritan, that we are all Gentiles. Point is, the truth that applied to that situation so important and disturbing to the church then while that situation didn't prevail today exactly as it did then, the truth is still applied to us today. And it can be of other races. Or it can even be people on different economic levels. And we treat them differently because of respect of persons. Which is condemned, which is sinful, which if you do, you lose your soul. Why is the desire to avoid controversy tempting 
Controversy is a demanding thing. Many, many years ago when I was a very young person, I remember visiting with Brother Woods about the possibility of debate I was going to have just to visit with him about the propositions and get his advice. Brother Guy in Woods. And his comment was, Brother Brown, I wish you could have a debate and you'd find out what studying to prepare for something really is like. Brother Woods told me the first debate he had, which had to be back in the 1920s or early 30s. He said, I studied so hard I dreamed about it. Controversy is demanding. You have to contend. You have to stand up and you end up having a target put on your back. You take a stand. And thus Jude had to remind the brethren when he was going to write to them about that which was common to all Christians. He said, I, I couldn't do that because it was a special problem. And so I was constrained to write unto you to contend for the faith once for all delivered the saints. You know, it's one thing to know that and for me to preach it and you to hear it and you to believe it and not deny it. It's another thing to do it. Now, you may be thinking about controversies as I've been in and standing in a pulpit and having a four-night debate and all that. Well, that is. That's controversial. It certainly is. There's differences. Things have to be discussed. But there's been a lot of debates that ended up converting people just over the back fence, the neighbors discussing things. But when you do that, you are taking a chance. They're not going to like you anymore if they don't agree with you. And sometimes we get the idea, well, I'm going to say this or I'm going to say that. And we say, oh, I don't know whether I want to do that or not. I might, I might not sit well with so-and-so. And every preacher that is faithful in all the Bible means about that, preaching sermons to a congregation so it will mean something to them for their good, Sometimes they're tempted to say, oh, better not say that. Especially today, such and such a person is here, and I'll save that when they're not here. Well, that doesn't do any good. You want to say it to the person who needs it. So there's all kinds of things that can tempt us not to approach something where we know there's disagreement. Even though we want to see the soul saved, no, they must believe the truth that they can't be saved. If you look at Ephesians 6, 14 through 17, you'll see that not only is ability to teach the truth and defend it and expose error important, but, but again, this business of being zealous for that cause of the truth and to save souls. And then the preparation I've already mentioned, Ephesians 6, 14 through 17. You have to be decisive. Taking a stand requires being decisive. Have you ever seen people that couldn't make up their mind? Is it water cold or hot? Uh, what, and they're just not going to take a position. Well, that's rather mild. There's some people like that. They just cannot come to conclusion. But when it comes to serving God and missing hell and gaining heaven, you have to be decisive in your approach to the Bible and listening to the truth be taught as to making up your mind to do what's right. Choose you this day whom you will serve. That's being decisive. Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Was, was Joshua a controversialist? I don't know how, how you know anything about Joshua and not say that he was. Well, did he want to be controversial? No, he just wanted everybody to obey God. Well, try that today's world. We as the Lord's church and members in particular want everybody to be saved. If you don't, there's something wrong with you because God certainly wants everybody to be saved. He died for every person on this earth. Everybody never lived. He died for them. But we're free moral agents. We have the power of choice. We're reasonable people or should be and we are to be taught and the Scripture reasons with us that God is, that Christ is the Son of God, the Bible is the Word of God, the Gospel is God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16. And we've got to be willing to accept what is true. And we can determine what's right or wrong, what's true or false. We must have a common standard. 
that we know is God's will, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And that will be our standard. We must know there is a right way to divide the word of truth and a wrong way or ways. We must come to these conclusions. We must know what we believe. 1 Peter 3, 15. We've got to be able to make a defense and give an explanation that's reasonable about what we believe, and it must come from the Bible. Again, studying comes out, 2 Timothy 2.15. When we stand for the truth and in opposition to error, whatever the error, we make ourselves a target. I've already mentioned that. And sometimes others will not stand with us, even when they know what's right and what's wrong, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 16. Paul even said of his first defense before Caesar, no man stood with me. Now, when you're reading all about these people that Paul lists, Paul says, when I first did this, everybody ran. Well, it's easier to stand up for something or oppose something when you've got a great group with you. It's very difficult when you have to stand all by yourself and everybody say, shut up, sit down, who are you, be quiet, uh, all this kind of stuff. And all you got to do is look at the Old Testament example of David. See how his old brothers treated him. And all the rest of the army. And how it was a confusion to him. How is it that this man, this uncircumcised Philistine, is defying all the armies of the living God? Hasn't God told us that if we'll stand for the truth and oppose our enemies, he'll be with us and nobody can beat us? Yes, he told them that over and over again. But why weren't all these other Israelites doing what he did? They didn't. So if you wait on everybody else to do what's right, you'll never do it. I mentioned this some time ago, maybe more than once, but it well serves a purpose. Brother Warren said one time he was preaching on uh, the church working together and everything being done decently in order. And the attitude of too many is, here we've got something to do. Maybe this is a good time to say this. We have work day coming up. Let George do it. And he said, there's a little boy sitting on the front seat and acting like any little boy. Said he said, you might not even know he's listening to him. But after several illustrations and comments of, let George do it, the little boy spoke up right out for the whole auditorium and said, George ain't going to do it. <laughs> well, what are we going to do when George won't do it? That leaves me. Brother Tant told about the time, or it was written about him, that he... I believe it was Tant, wasn't it? One of the old pioneer preachers. Who in this place, there was a guy who every time the people wanted to do something, and he knew that the others that were members did not have the wherewithal financially to do what he could do. So to shut out anything when it came to spending money, anytime they came up, he'd say, All right. I'll spend half of it, I'll, put on, I'll, I'll spend the other half, I'll pay for the other half. And everybody couldn't do that, that much or whatever it was. And then a new man moved in town, new brother. And he started being well-known among the church, involved and everything, and they had a business meeting. Same thing came up. And the old complainer said again, well, you all pay for half of it, I'll pay for the rest. And that new man there said, good, you and me will put the roof on the building. Somebody has to stand up and do what they can do according to their several ability, whether that's much or little. Don't have a phobia. Era unchecked dealing with that spreads like a gangrene or a cancer. Paul even used that terminology of error spreading like a cancer in 2 Timothy 2, 16 through 18. And you don't mess with that. We, this generation, above all people, ought to know how you have to deal with cancer. Well, the Holy Spirit says error in the church is like a cancer. Now, how should we deal with it? We'll talk about it a year from now. We'll work. There are people who will abandon the truth and some will gradually drift away. That's what you got with the Hebrews, Hebrews 2 verse 1. But some will even surprise somebody like the Apostle Paul and depart quickly. Remember Galatians 1, 6-7, I marvel that you're so soon. 
departing. Either way, they depart. In reality, we put our own souls in danger by remaining silent. Now, I hear sometimes silent is golden. The problem I found with that is usually people are silent when they ought to speak up. And then they speak up when they ought to shut up. As a watchman, and that's used in the Old Testament to teach us about godliness under the authority of Christ in the New Testament. In Ezekiel 3, 17 through 18, Ezekiel is a prophet like a watchman on the wall, and they had him on all those cities. And they cry out in the middle of the morning, 2.30 and all is well. Well, the reason done in these verses, 17 and 18, is, is if you do your duty as a watchman and the city's attached, or attacked, then you've saved your own soul because you fulfilled your personal, individual responsibility as a watchman. But if the city's attacked and you were asleep on the job, then it's going to be required of thee because you didn't do what only you could do and ought to do and took the job to do. Is there anything like that in the church today, brethren? So what is the remedy to this ungodly safe silence? Well, Paul said false teachers must be silenced. Not good brethren teaching the truth be silenced. Paul dealt with that in Titus chapter 1, 9 through 11. Their mouths must be stopped. Greek word is their mouth is crammed so full they can't wiggle their tongue. That's what good brethren are to do to anybody, false brethren or otherwise, who try to teach false doctrine. They ought to be met, silenced. And those words are said in the context of the responsibility of elders and preachers working with them to get the job done. But I tell you this, over the years there's been more efforts to gag the preacher than it has been to gag the false teacher. Rather than remaining safe while some abandon the truth, then we need to do what Jude said. Contend for the faith, Jude 3. And then encourage others who are standing up for the truth. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3. Now let me use an illustration that's going on right now in the secular realm. Would you say that the Western world has been encouraging the Ukrainians as they resist the invasion of Russia? Yeah, they are. A lot involved in that encouragement. A lot involved in the army of the Lord when the fellow soldiers encourage us to be what only we can be. For if the church does not spread the gospel and defend the faith, who's going to do it? So rather than endangering our soul with silence, our whole goal is that we declare the whole counsel of God, Acts 20, 26 through 27. Thus, we meet whatever particular issue there is that's challenging any particular part of the whole counsel of God. That demands a lot of dedication, a lot of study, a lot of zeal. And then, as Brother Wood used to tell me as a young preacher, he said the first qualification of a preacher is to have skin about an inch thick. Because it'll, it'll certainly be pricked. <laughs> it'll certainly be worked on when you start Teaching the people what they need to hear, not necessarily what they want to hear. And continuing to preach it when they'd rather you not. Remember what Brother Keeble said about preaching the word in season and out of season? You preach the word in season, that is when they want it. And out of season, you still preach the word even when they don't want it. It's the word that's a seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. It's the word that's sown in the soils of men, the minds of men, the hearts of men. And it'll never get sown into the person with an honest and good heart, Luke 8, 15, if we try to, you know, back off a little bit. There are other phobias that we could talk about. We may do it later on. That come from the idea of, let me be safe. Don't. Don't wake me up. Don't bother me. Let George do it. <laughs> oh, there'll always be somebody else to do that. Now, I mentioned this this morning. I'll close on this. Ten years from now, who's going to be teaching in our classrooms? In view of the way each one of us are conducting ourselves right now, who's going to do it? Who's going to be preaching the gospel of Christ and contending for the faith? As we are preparing ourselves right now because every member is a teacher of truth 
We're not like the denominations where you have a pastor system and the members sit there and whatever else they do, but it's the preacher's problem. Because in reality, every member of the church has an obligation to fortify themselves with the truth and live it and teach it and contend for it. We'll all be able to do all the same thing? Well, I know the Bible's full of material saying that won't happen. But I can guarantee you one thing. You will never know whether you can or you can't if you take the safe course. You'll just stay safe. No one ever said controversy is pleasant. I can tell you right now it's not. But there are times when it's necessary to stand for the right and oppose all that opposes it. Now somebody says, yeah, but why? I had one person tell me when I was before Jordan and I ever married, my first full-time work. You know, that's going to be a long time ago now. <laughs> or half a century. A lady came out one day and she was just bristling. She was probably at that time about how old I am now. She says, why don't you just preach the gospel and let the denominations alone? Now, she'd been a, quote, member of the church, unquote, for a long time. She didn't have any idea what she was saying. How do you reach anybody, whatever their error is, atheism, agnosticism, denominationalism, whatever it is, and leave them alone? Will you tell me that? Go ye into all the world and leave them alone. Leave every creature alone. Don't upset them. Don't shake the waters. The nature of truth means it is controversial. But we must abide in the truth and all that abiding therein demands of each one of us. Standing for the truth and opposing error is part of the whole New Testament system or the faith for which we must contend and not remain in a safe space. Now I ask you, um, when I started out, you have any phobias? After studying this lesson, if you listen and honestly applied it, do you have any phobias? There's some of you that have stood up and preached, but I can guarantee you, regardless of how good you were the first time you decided to stand up, you shook a little bit. You had stage fright. Well, then why, if it costs that of you, did you go ahead and do it? Why didn't you just remain safe and be a pew packer. And that's not to put down people packing the pews. I wish all these were packed. But if you can do more, then God expects it. And how do you know if you don't try? If you're not a child of God, you will have to be controversial, number one, with your own self. Because you'll start thinking about now, if I do this from the heart, genuinely believing it, repenting of my sins and all that means, and confessing my faith in Christ before men, and I'm baptized in Christ for the remission of my sins, you know what's going to cross your mind probably? What's so and so going to say about this when they find out about it? How are they going to treat me? What does this mean that I must do and that I must give up and how I have to alter my life? And when it comes to being a Christian, have we ever got past that? <laughs> we must. We must step out there on the basis of it's authorized by God and God wants us to and it's good and it's the thing to do and we have very limited time to do it and we must do it while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. There is an end to opportunity. You have to begin somewhere. And you begin right where you are. So obey the gospel, become a Christian, and put all you have into it. Don't let anything stop you. Be faithful no matter what. The child of God, if you've ceased in that, then there's repentance, confession of sins, and asking God to forgive you. And don't wait. You have now. You don't know about the rest. So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come. All together, we stand and sing.